Welcome everyone. Um, again, just for the recording sake, uh, I'm Catherine Sherry from HD Reach. With us today to talk about irritability um, is Dr. Mary Edmondson. She is the founder of HD Reach. Um, and many of you may know her just from the community and from um, her being part of many different practices over the year, but I, over the years, I will let Dr. Edmondson introduce herself a little bit more and then we will get started with the presentation. Dr. Edmondson. Thank you, Catherine. It's um, great to be with you guys today. <clears throat> I wanted to just give you a disclaimer that this is the first time I've given this presentation. And, you know, the first time you run through something, you always find bugs. And so my notes page didn't pop up exactly like I hoped it would. So I've got separate notes. And so if I'm not staring at you and I'm looking at my notes, um, just know that's why. And I'll get better at this the more I do it. But um, hopefully... Uh, it won't be too much of a nuisance. Um, so um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm the founder of HD Reach. Um, I'm an internist. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I'm currently working with um, UNC to set up a new Huntington's disease program there um, in the next few months um, and have been involved in um, HD advocacy um, as a family member and, in, you know, in patient care for like 50 years, which blows me away that I've lived 50 years, but to, you know, to think about how long um, I've, I've been working with this is uh, kind of a humbling thing. So um, we'll get started. I just wanted to let you know a few things. Um, one is that there are no FDA approved treatments for irritability associated with Huntington's disease. And everything I'm going to do is going to be um, off label. Um, there are consensus guidelines that have been developed by global um, experts <clears throat> that help us um, provide guidance for their use. Um, and there are at least two new drugs in the research pipeline. The other is that I want to remind you that um, treatment needs to be individualized in partnership with a healthcare provider. And this is this presentation is intended is not intended to provide advice and certainly is not intended to replace medical care. Um, I do some consulting work with CHDI and Unicure um, at the present time. Um, we're going to we're going to do some additional things um, today's talk that we um, in addition to just presenting information and and um, pearls um, and doing question and answers. We're going to actually do some um, coping skills or meditations throughout um, this presentation. If you've never meditated, it's not hard. Um, and these are guided meditations, which means you, all you really have to do is listen. Um, and we can talk more in the Q&A about how to implement this in your daily life, but I wanted to give you a, 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 a taste of it. Um, and then we're going to talk about irritability and irritable aggression and go through some different odds and ends of things that I hope will help. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was triggers. Um, so some people, but not by no means all people who have HD or are members of HD families or HD caregivers have had traumatic, traumatic experiences related to irritability and develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Um, I think recently we have begun to understand that our criteria for post-traumatic stress is limited. <laughs> um, it was first recognized in veterans and women who had undergone sexual trauma, but we now know that traumatic events can span um, a, a lifetime of experience. Um, these events can occur in day-to-day -day life, um, and we've sort of been taught to just tolerate them. Um, for example, things like bullying or adverse childhood experiences, chaotic family relationships, traumatic childbirth, a parent's death, and unexpected job, lo job loss, and even secondary trauma. For example, watching the events of January 5th on the television. So adverse childhood events occur more frequently in HD youth, and, and people in HD families are at greater risk of trauma. Um, people who have HD may have had traumatic events in, in their childhood, and that may affect their behavior. Um, this occurs more frequently in people who don't have um, a supportive relationship at the time of the trauma. 
or lack knowledgeable medical care, mental health care in particular, where the disease is not identified early when only behavioral symptoms are present. Re-experiencing traumatic memories can cause an intolerable adrenaline surge, anxiety, panic, or an uncontrollable urge to get away from the pain. If this happens to you today during this presentation, mute yourself, mute the presentation entirely, take a break and take care of yourself. When you're ready and you feel safe, please come back. If you need help, we have staff members who can help you. So let me tell you a little story about why I think this is important. In 2013, HD Reach hosted the Huntington Study Group on annual meeting in Charlotte. We ran a campaign to find HD families to encourage them to come to the meeting. We even ran an article in the local Charlotte paper about HD and the meeting itself. And this effort encouraged 30 new families to attend, people who had never talked to another person in an HD family, had never talked to an HD specialist. I think people seeking help for the first time are particularly vulnerable because they're having to process a lot of information rapidly at that first meeting um, and sometimes painful things come up. So in the afternoon of the meeting, I ran a session with one of my colleagues about HD behaviors. I talked a little bit about behavior and then people started asking questions and, and talking together. Um, one woman began telling her story, which was honest and raw. She had um, taken that first step of making contact and was prepared to open up and hear more to help her navigate her circumstances. In the middle of her story, two young women sitting near to each other, sitting next to each other, but near the door, immediately got up and ran out of the room. They ran so fast, my colleague couldn't catch them to see if they were okay or if she could help. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know whether they reached out again to us or sought health care, but I tell you, it was really heartbreaking to watch. What this experience taught me is that I can't assume that I know where people are at. I don't know if you have advanced coping skills or if you're in great distress. For this reason, we're gonna take some breaks today and practice some mindfulness exercises. I'm going to trust you to care for yourself, to know your limits and the warning signs that information being discussed is too much. It's okay to mute the presentation and come back when you feel safe again. As Catherine mentioned, the presentation is being recorded so you can listen to it later. If it's still too painful or you feel a real strong urge to escape or avoid, please give HD Reach a chance to help you. Contact our staff. People with post-traumatic stress often need support of a therapist and we can help you locate help and resources. There are many paths to post-traumatic recovery and growth. Um, I invite you to become part of the HD Reach community, many of whom have struggled, survived, and now are thriving following the traumas of HD. There are many pathways to recovery and growth. So we're gonna to start today um, with a grounding um, meditation. Um, so what does grounding exactly mean anyway? Um, I, I find that I can explain concepts like this with examples. So I'm gonna share an experience I had that taught me the power of mindfulness. After my father died about 25 years ago from HD, I had a very complicated reaction. Really, to my surprise, I was intensely angry at him, and I couldn't remember anything good about him. In retrospect, I was profoundly sad, um, but distanced myself from, my, from that intolerable grief with anger, and I ended up depressed. I finally went to see a psychiatrist. And it took me an entire year to learn the language of mental health. My psychiatrist kept talking about space. What does space mean anyway? Quote, you go to a space inside you where you can feel safe or calm. What does that mean exactly? 
my husband and I sort of um, called it psychobabble, really, which over time I learned was an easy way to dismiss how hard it is to describe my inner experiences. I just wanted the depression to go away. So it took me about a year to understand that my ocean, my emotions were my obstacle. I would fight them and judge myself as a weak person because I had, I, um, uh, I just judged myself because I had those emotions and they would last and last for hours, for days or months. Then I accidentally realized that my emotions were really valid. And more than that, they were really important. Even though they seemed out of my control, they didn't require my judgment or reaction to live through them. I began to think of them as a wave that hit me and knocked me down to the sand. Then the wave, wave would recede and I'd get up and walk away. I found out that if I didn't fight my emotions or judge myself, instead if I embraced them as information about who I was and what mattered to me, pain or the tension or whatever overwhelming feelings I felt would go away really within about a minute. And what I had actually experienced was mindfulness. Then my daughter Holly decided she wanted to learn and teach yoga. We had many conversations and she guided me through meditations that helped me to focus on her speech rather than my inner thoughts. In fact, she reinforced, reinforced ideas about self-acceptance, compassion, and letting go. Then my husband told me about a book called 10% Happier by Stan Harris. I also read the evolving science um, that showed mindfulness meditation was evidence-based, with studies revealing positive impact of, of meditation for depression, anxiety, chronic pain, and chronic medical conditions. So I decided to try and make meditation part of my daily life. I did feel better by about 10%. Now when things um, build up for me, I know to ask myself, have you been meditating recently? And the answer is almost invariably that I had missed a few days. So um, I told you about Dan Harris. He's an um, ABC journalist who had a panic attack on national television and eventually coined the term meditation for fidgety skeptics, which um, actually was me all those years back ago. Um, and, and what he says is we are bombarded with stimuli, things happening around us, internal thoughts and feelings in response to what's going on around us, and then just random thoughts. These experiences create very powerful emotions like anger or fear or sadness or even boredom. And we are just owned by them. Meditation is the ability to know what is happening in your mind at any given time without being carried away by it. For me, it's the antidote to inner chaos. So Holly recorded a guided grounding practice for us. It's going to take about five minutes. And um, hopefully this is going to work. Welcome to a five minute grounding practice. Allow yourself a moment to get comfortable and settle in. You might allow your feet to feel planted into the floor and your body to relax into the support underneath you. You could grow your spine tall from the base of your tailbone all the way to the top of your head. I invite you to settle your gaze somewhere on the floor in front of you or close your eyes if you feel safe to do so. Begin to notice your surroundings, sounds, smells, the feeling of the air or clothing on your skin. Take a moment to notice the rhythm of your breathing. Breathing slowly in, feeling expansion and fullness. Release the breath slowly out. Notice the settling and softening 
Take three more slow breaths at your own pace, paying attention to the wave-like movements in your body. If your mind begins to wander, see if you can notice where it goes. And as if helping a friend, gently and kindly guide it back to the practice. Breathing in and out. You could invite in one more smooth inhale and release it slowly out of the mouth with a big sigh. Gently guide your attention to rest in the places your body makes contact with the support beneath you. Any sensations in the bottoms of your feet, the backs of your legs, and in your seat. You could imagine you have roots growing into the ground beneath you holding you steady and secure. Allow your body to feel grounded, your feet rooted, your spine uplifted and strong from the base of your tailbone. Notice your shoulders relax. Your hands release any tension and rest in your lap. The muscles in your jaw and face soften. You could notice anywhere that might be holding or gripping and see if you could invite those areas to release. There's nowhere you need to go, nothing that you need to do in this moment. You are safe, supported, and strong in this steady, grounded foundation you have built. Allow the ground and gravity to hold you securely in this present moment. Rest for a few silent moments in this peaceful, grounded awareness that you have created. Begin to notice sensations, sounds, and your breathing. Bring yourself back into wherever it is that you are. When you're ready, you can gently open the eyes and invite soft movement into the fingers and toes. Thank you for sharing your time and attention with me. I don't know about you guys, but I feel better. Welcome to... <laughs> she decided she was going to do it twice. Um, okay, so we're going we're gonna to get into the, the meat and potatoes of um, irritability. So the definition... Um, uh, hold on one, just one second. So what I wanted to mention first is that Irritability in HD is not a person just having a bad day. If you, meaning your family member or caregiver, if you're tired or hungry or overstimulated by stress, you can fear, feel irritable or say something you didn't mean. You realize that your response wasn't appropriate to the situation and you make amends. Sometimes the person who is the target of your irritability will remind you that your response was inappropriate to help you gain insight into your behavior. Then you make amends and you don't do it again. You stop the behavior. Irritability in HD is entirely different. 
It is the result of damage to the brain in areas that activate and inhibit angry emotions, thoughts, and behavior. It's not your fault. You didn't provoke the anger. It's not the HD person's fault either. It's the result of a disease, not a character flaw, selfishness, or immaturity. The formal definition of HD-related irritability is a mood state that sets a person up for angry emotions, thought patterns, and certain behaviors like intense anxiety or aggression. It's characterized by a sudden episode of rage followed by periods of calm. Episodes can last a minute or hours to days. It's, un it's unprovoked or in response to very trivial um, triggers. Many people describe it as um, walking on eggshells. It's unpleasant for the irritable person and experienced by others as negative emotions directed at them. Irritability can have marked functional outcomes. It may alter family dynamics, interpersonal relationships, resulting sometimes in divorce or estrangement, can impair job performance, resulting in job loss, and may, interpreted by, may be interpreted by law enforcement as defiant or criminal behavior, resulting in arrest. People who are physically or emotionally close to the irritable person, like caregivers and family members, are most often the target of irritability. So what is prevalence? Prevalence is the frequency of an event in a population of people. So let's say we took 100 people who had Huntington's disease and asked how many of those people have irritability. And if you looked at those people at one point in time, just one point in time, about 38 to 73% of people have HD-related irritability. These studies looked at people of all stages of disease, which is why there's such a large range. Um, the, the lower numbers tend to be in people who are earlier in the stage of their disease, and the 73% is um, people later in their disease. In a longitudinal study, a study like in Roll HD, where you go in for a baseline visit, and then you're followed over time, for those people who had motor manifest Huntington's disease, um, at their baseline visit, about 50% of people reported being irritable and 83% of people reported being irritable at some point in their illness course. Really important point, irritability can precede motor onset by seven to 15 years. It can be the first symptom of the disease. Okay, um, so when I was in med school, we, you know, when you're in med school, you get all this information, you get tons and tons and tons of information about, you know, pretty highly specialized things sometimes. And when you're a student, you're like, you know, would somebody boil this down to what I really need to remember? And so um, our attendings, who were those kind of people, um, would always talk about pearls of wisdom and eventually got abbreviated to just pearls. So I'm going to tell you about four things that I think are um, pretty important basic topics and give you um, some examples um, and detailed discussion about some of them. Um, I found this quote and really liked it. The heart is very much like the sea. It has its storms. It has its tides. And in its depths, it has its pearls too. Okay, so the first thing to do is seek medical care. Um, some people say that the first thing that you should do is, is non-pharmacologic intervention, interventions that have to do with adapting the environment. But I think that you need to figure out which is gonna be, which is gonna get you the most rapid response. And I think if you already have a, a, an HD doctor or if you have a reliable primary care doctor who's been helpful to you in the past or a local provider of some type, then I think that probably the, the place to start is with medical care. Um, I mean, it can truly be life um, saving. So if, if there's somebody that you trust, you speak with them, um, even though they may not be able to um, share any information with you, 
you can tell them stuff. Um, and you, you can ask them to keep it confidential if you feel like retribution is a concern or um, and and or ask them if you know right up front in the beginning if they would keep it confidential. Um, anyway, um, a doctor can talk to you about medications. They can talk to you about the risks and benefits of those medications, um, and uh, you know can help you balance the, that um, so you can make a good choice. I'm a psychologist or a mental health therapist for you if you're a caregiver or you're a family member, can be extremely helpful. They can help you th think through your actions and support you during the treatment process. The treatment process, meaning you identify that you have a problem and you go through seeing a doctor, prescribing medications, learning non-pharmacologic treatments, that whole entire process. Um, this this, this type of support may be critical if the patient resists or refuses medical, medical care or if they refuse to see the doctor. There are several medication approaches to irritability that work very well. Plus, they may work quickly, which is, you know, unlike many psychiatric medications. So here are the main medications. Um, the first line medication is an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Drugs in this class include Prozac um, or fluoxetine, sertraline, citalopram, Paxil or paroxetine, and fluvoxamine. These drugs are typically prescribed for depression, anxiety, or obsessive compulsive symptoms but they work very well and work quickly, as I mentioned, for HD-related irritability. Plus, they're really cheap. Most insurance co-payments are like five or ten dollars, and programs like GoodRx um, uh, cost you know a similar amount of money or even better. There's also a nonprofit in North Carolina that supplies a 90-day supply of most of these medications for free for people who meet um, income requirements. So talk to your doctor about which one of these drugs is right for your loved one, or if one of them might be right for you. In Europe, um, mirtazapine, it's also, mirtazapine is also available in the United States, but the European recommendations suggest that you um, also try mirtazapine. It has a different mechanism of action um, compared to um, SSRIs, but it is used for depression and anxiety and it has helpful side effects of weight gain, improved sleep, and sedation. Um, if irritability is severe or very frequent, or SSRIs or other drugs are not enough, then neuroleptics, also called antipsychotics or dopamine blockers, are helpful. Low to moderate doses of risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, or aripiprazole are helpful, and they are often affordable. This class of drugs is also helpful for perseverative behaviors, residual major depression symptoms, career management, and anxiety. So you get a, you know, a lot of bang for your buck. Talk to your doctor about which one of these drugs might be helpful for your loved one. If a person has improved but still has symptoms or they, they have you know, really difficult to manage um, irritable aggression, mood stabilizers, also from a class of drugs that are ant called anti-seizure medications um, uh, might help, particularly Depakote and um, carbamazepine or Tegretol. Benzodiazepines like lorazepam or alprazolam or Valium um, are used frequently in irritable patients, but there needs to be caution because um, these, uh, these drugs might cause mental cloudiness um, and increase falls. Lithium is an interesting drug. It's been around for a long time and it's been shown in multiple patient populations to reduce irritability and aggression. It does, however, have some side effects, some of which are serious or, either, or even lethal. So lithium is really reserved for very compliant patients with intractable irritability. Um, anytime somebody is irritable, you also need to look for co-occurring problems like sleep disorders, malnutrition or hunger, infection, injury, constipation, et cetera.
So the second thing is to create an adaptive environment. And this is easier said than done. So we're going to go through a number of um, a number of different um, topics. Um, whoops! The first thing that you need to do um, is to understand a few things, and one of them is that creating an adaptive environment really starts with acceptance. This is tough. How can you accept irritability when you're in the middle of your own emotional storm? How can you accept irritability when you're unsure you're safe? How can you accept completely unacceptable behavior in another adult? This is a really important starting place. The person with HD has no control over this behavior. It's a brain circuit that's faulty. They have lost the gate that opens to let behavior happen and closes when that behavior is no longer useful. It's not bad. It's not good. It just is. And no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you are not going to change the brain of a person with Huntington's disease. If you have a normal brain, and I'm going to make the assumption that you do, you actually have the ability to inhibit and express your emotions and thoughts, and then make an intentional choice about your own behavior. Here's the problem. If you're busy being owned by your emotions and thoughts in response to irritability, you can't use the reasonable part of your mind to choose your next actions. What's happening inside you? How do you typically respond to conflict or angry people? Do you have a personal history of trauma yourself? Does irritability frighten you? Do you feel compelled to withdraw? Do you cower in fear, fear and feel shame that you can't stand up to the irritable person? Are you angry at them? Are you angry that your life is not going according to plan? Are you confused about the role that you play in the irritability? Are you mad at yourself that you can't make it better? Do you feel guilty that it's your fault? Do you have intrusive thoughts that the person with Huntington's a bad person and their behavior is childish? If it happens in public, are you embarrassed? You need to ask yourself all of these questions and probably more when things are calm. You might need someone to help you think through these questions like a close friend or a therapist. You have to understand the difference between what is you and what is the behavior you are trying to solve. You do, you do not need to work to change the person with HD because you can't. What you can develop, however, are healthy responses. So let's talk about what you can safely do immediately when someone is irritable. First thing to do is remove vulnerable people from the environment. Second, listen to your own sense of fear and trust it. Don't think twice about getting out of there if your brain tells you to. Your fear response is hardwired in your brain. It quickly calculates risk and delivers you an instinctive answer. Listen to it. This is probably the number one thing that most people do is they, because this fear response, this instinct is very, very, very brief. Um, I can tell you that the times that I have been assaulted in my career were when I didn't pay attention to this. And and the published literature um, supports that, that, that many healthcare providers, and I suspect many family members too, don't listen to this instinct. If you have to leave, we'll talk about what to do in a section coming up. But if you decide it's safe to stay there, step back and give the person with Huntington's disease space. If you or they are cornered, physically create space for an exit. Remove anything that's overstimulating. For example, cut off the TV, stop the noisy dishwasher, ask guests to leave. Keep your hands loosely at your sides and don't take a defensive stance like putting your hands on your hips or standing over the person with HD. Lower your tone of voice. Slow the rate of your speech. 
Use silence to calm the environment. Don't ever be confrontational. Don't ever try and reason with that person who's irritable. If it's safe, just wait it out. When things are calmer, ask the person what they need and then wait for an answer. As long as it takes, wait for an answer. Are they hungry? Do they need to use the restroom? Are they in pain? Look for triggers and patterns. We're gonna talk about that in a second. So what is the benefit of this approach? One, you are taking care of yourself first. You're acknowledging the risks, keeping yourself safe, learning more and more about how to handle this behavior safely in the moment. You are also learning things about yourself you might not have known before. You are also keeping other people safe. Most importantly, you are protecting the person with irritability. When managed well, irritability is less likely to escalate into even more aggressive and dangerous behaviors. For example, you're avoiding police involvement and arrest. You're avoiding physical injuries to the person with HD and maybe even yourself. You might be able to avoid a psychiatric admission, which is a really hard experience for people with HD. You're also protecting their relationships with important people in their life, like their children. Using healthy, non-judgmental responses, you are building and strengthening your relationship with the person with HD. That person will gain trust that you care about them as a person and that you don't pity them. They will believe that HD behaviors won't scare you off, that you won't abandon them when they need you the most. Consider positive intent. Positive intent is asking yourself, in what universe could this behavior be reasonable? So does the irritable person have something legitimate to complain about? Are they being over controlled? Are they still able to do things, but you're doing them for them anyway because it takes them longer to do that task? Have you ignored their preferences because it takes extra time to ask? People get angry when their rights are infringed upon, and in the face of HD, that will likely end up with an irritable episode. As you strengthen your relationship and the person with HD trusts you, you can begin preventing future episodes and future problems. It might be possible for you to have a reasonable conversation with a person with HD when they are calm. You can tell them how you feel about them, how important they are to you, if that is actually true. You can talk about how to handle HD challenges together. I know it's hard to imagine, but by creating an adaptive environment and using the right medications, it can happen. Although it's easier for the person with HD to be aware of symptoms and to communicate in earlier stages of disease, it doesn't mean that you can't start with this approach in any stage of disease. People with HD experience love, kindness, and patience regardless of where they are in the course of their illness. Acceptance frees you to choose your response. Acceptance is the core foundation to how to approach irritability and, frankly, all HD behaviors. If you cannot do this, if you've lost your ability to care, there are still options. I'll never forget a man who approached me after I gave a talk on HD behaviors who said, you know, all these tips and tricks you just described, what if I don't want to do that? It's too much work for me, and our relationship is so damaged now, I just don't care anymore. What am I supposed to do? Well, the answer to that is, it's up to you to find someone who can care. Someone you bring into your house, a family member to help, find respite care so that you can clear your head, or find a residential placement. You are still living up to your responsibility to that person by delegating the work of caring to someone else. If you start to feel your relationship is fading away and you can't do it any longer, it's better to accept where you are and get to work on finding a break from it or finding someone else who can do what you can't.
So let's talk about some common behavioral triggers for irritability. Um, I have a colleague of mine out in California who runs um, a large long-term care facility for people with um, neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric problems. And her opinion is that the very first thing that you do for somebody with Huntington's is give them some food. Um, because hunger is so prevalent in, in people with HD and they may not be able to really express that that's what the problem is. Um, fatigue is also, um, a, can be a trigger for irritability. Illness or injury, um, perhaps there's problems with medication adherence, you know, they've, like me, not practicing meditation for, you know, a few to several days. Maybe medication is um, has been missed. Um, they might be in pain. They might be dehydrated. They might be constipated. So all those physical problems that people have that make all of us kind of irritable and cranky um, could also be a precursor to irritability. Things specific to irritability, though, are change in routine. If a loved one expects to watch a particular show at nine o'clock in the morning, and for some reason they can't, then they're at higher risk for an irritable um, um, episode. If there's a total lack of structure, that is what happens on one day is completely different than the next and the day after that, that in and of itself can be so overstimulating that the only way that people can, can, can communicate that it's too much for them is through an irritable episode. Recent losses can cause irritability, things like a loss of job, um, no longer being able to drive, that type of thing. Holidays and special events are particularly stimulating and um, sometimes kind of overwhelming for people with HD. And like maybe halfway through or three quarters of the way through, they have an irritable event just because of all the overstimulation. Um, in America, people have a lot of strong political views that are very polarized these days. And, you know, so political or civil, uh, civic events can also be triggering. Um, my, my brother was really stuck on politics. So we learned that we just simply could never, ever bring that topic up. And then change in so social support, like you have um, a daughter who's been incredibly helpful to you and all of a sudden she has to move away. Um, or you're, the caregiver um, has to go to the hospital for some reason. Or the person that comes on Tuesday to spend time with that person um, is not there. So, so these are some common triggers um, and these are things to look for as you, you think about um, irritability in your loved one. So some example of behavioral patterns. So um, if there's a pattern of repetitive questions, what might be the underlying problem is anxiety. And what the potential solution might be is to increase structure, have a really visible calendar in a prominent location. Um, if irritability is associated with sleep problems, you might suspect that that person would be fatigued. So modify sleep hygiene and talk to your doctor about sleep medication. If somebody is irritable while driving, and I mean irritable while you're driving, they may be, they may be fatigued because they just went through a four-hour visit at the doctor's office, or they might be hungry because they didn't have their afternoon snack. So the thing I'd do is I would suggest a nap or a rest period um, beforehand and sort of some special snacks or something so that people's tank is sort of filled up. And then pick out favorite music during the car travel that's distracting. During meal times, if somebody gets irritable or starts pushing you away or other things like that, um, it's good to remind yourself that um, choking is pretty common in Huntington's disease. And if that person's not choking themselves, they may still be afraid of it because they may have witnessed it in their parent. The other thing is that they may be extremely hungry. Um, people with HD need three to 5,000 calories a day, and that's pretty hard to get in. So schedule meals or snacks earlier in the day or more frequently, um, and then have some assistive devices around like assistive cutlery or spill-proof cups if um, messiness um, bothers the person with HD. 
Um, dressing and bathing. So it's really weird, but some people with Huntington's have fear of water. And I don't know whether it is fear of falling into water, that it's, it's like a recollection of falling into water or whether or not um, when, you know, if you're taking a shower, you, um, a person with Huntington's might have involuntary inspiration. So they may be afraid to get in the shower um, and which you know, eventually becomes a hygiene problem. They may also fear falling. Um, so what you um, might do if you think it's primarily anxiety is you can um, combine bathing with a pleasant activity like music. Um, and if, if falling or other things like that are a concern, you can always put in grab bars as much for yourself as for the person with Huntington's. And then if finances are an issue, um, you can imagine somebody who is unemployed um, and doesn't have a good sense of when money is coming in and how money is going out. You know, it's a loss of control of, of that, that, that financial matters might be a real anxiety and very legitimate anxiety in, in many families. So if if you can't completely ignore the topic of finances, prepare all that financial information ahead of time and discuss very you know, high level highlights only. So like, this is how much money we spent last month. This is how much money we brought in. And this is what we have left over. Isn't it great we have that much left over this month? And if there's a decision to be made that you think that person is still able to participate in, allow them an opportunity to do that. Okay, management of coexisting behaviors. So this, um, so there are a lot of behaviors in Huntington's. There's depression and um, apathy and perseverative behaviors. Um, there's a whole lot of, and, and the perseverative behaviors being really one of the harder ones. And so there are um, some different techniques that you can try that um, are behavioral techniques that can help. For example, Redirection is probably the most useful um, intervention that you can you can offer. Um, so what you do is immediately change the subject. So it has to happen very, very early in the progression of the, um, the behavior. So if you're noticing that somebody with HD has got this little tiny bit of irritability going on, you redirect them to something else. You change the subject. You start a new activity. You move to a different location in your house. You give the person a job. Um, you place an object in their hand so that they have, um, or, or you provide them with some sort of a sensory stimulus that's distracting. Use um, emotionally neutral activities um, to the, they're the key to redirection, so they'd be neither highly desirable nor unpleasant. So that'll work with irritability and most other HD behaviors. Um, limit setting, um, this may work best for repetitive perseverative behaviors. So what you, you might do is give people five tickets for five phone calls, and when the tickets are gone, that topic or activity is no longer allowed. Um, um, color coding helps. Um, limit setting is often useful for people who benefit from the new perseverative behavior becoming a deliberate focus of attention. So for example, if somebody's perseverating and walking around the room such that they're exhausting themselves and losing weight because they're exhausting themselves, you can redirect them to a different perseverative behavior that, that is seated. Um, and it, you know, as long as when people perseverate, it, it as long as it's not harmful um, and they're not unhappy, there's no reason to not let it, you know, allow a perseverative behavior. A token economy uh, structure, um, it, this is something that takes time um, and it has to be implemented with total consistency. It won't work if, if you expect instant re results. So the key thing is that people have a stimulus and then they behave. And if you don't want them to do that behavior, right? You got one of two choices, you do nothing. And in a lot of cases, we punish people who do things we don't think need to be done. 
That does not work. Punishment never works. It confuses that person who's trying to figure out what to do to get a reward. So what you want them to do is not do the negative behavior. And when that happens, you give them a reward. If they're doing the behavior, they lose the reward, but you don't punish them. Remember that a negative look or a sigh or, or you know, some facial expression or some body language can be perceived as punishment. And the rewards, rewards can be very simple, but must be immediate and consistent. This takes time, and I don't think this will work for irritability. Um, a paired stimulus plan was what I was talking about with people in, this, um, um, in the car while you're driving and are irritable. What you're doing is you're adding in a pleasant activity um, that, so that you pair that with, with something that provides distraction. Actually, changing behavior can happen, but it takes loads of patience and it has to be completely consistent. And basically what you're doing is very slowly teaching people um, how to do a behavior um, instead of walking repetitively around the room. Um, that also goes along with that, um, the limit setting I was talking about. And finally, you can wait out the behavior. Um, if you feel like you're in danger, again, listen to yourself and leave. Um, if the behavior is driven by brain injury, ignoring it will likely increase the problem. If the behavior is motivated in part by the person's desire to gain attention or other positive responses from you, simply ignoring the behavior may be an option in certain circumstances. So solving these problems requires creativity and you're going to need a trial and error period where you are figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So you may make a choice to wait out a behavior and see if it goes away. And if it doesn't, then because you know how to handle irritability, you respond that way. Or you can wait out the behavior and it, it goes away. And you know that that's your strategy for the next go around, the next time it happens. Always ask if there's an underlying need that should be met. Ask yourself this question. Is there something that they need that the environment should be pro or could provide for them? The last thing, and I think this is, really the almost the most important thing I can tell you about all this is find a partner, somebody who is willing to talk to you about these behaviors and help you sort through them. They can help you find creative ways to solve these problems. And that sort of behavior partner might be the HD Center social worker, it might be HD Reach staff, um, it might be a therapist, and a, another HD family caregiver from a support group or a family member. I can promise you that no one can solve the problems of HD by themselves. No one person can provide everything that a person with Huntington's needs. Um, and I mean, you just cannot provide 24 hour a day care over the long haul. So you, at some point or another, you're gonna have to have somebody come in and help you. Obviously there are financial concerns about that. Um, and you're going to, you know, you may not be able to afford that, but you, you can certainly see if there are resources um, in the faith community or some of the other resources that you have through the HD centers and HD reach who can, who can help you. Okay, active recovery. Okay, after the irritable episode is completely resolved and it's safe for you to do so. Give your time, yourself time to recover. Wait until your own nervous system is back to normal. Have a cup of tea. Use the restroom. Eat lunch. Meditate for five minutes. Give yourself enough space to compose yourself. There's nothing more important for you to do right now than take care of yourself. So I'm talking about that moment right after an irritable episode where that person is stable again and you've got them sitting in front of the television and they're watching their television show and the kids are all okay. And every, you know, it's like everything's over. There's nothing more important for you to do than take care of yourself and to give your space to, yourself space to recover. The second thing is to tell somebody about the, the episode. It's, 
it's so much worse when you're having to deal with this by yourself. Um, and, and you need an opportunity in a safe environment to be able to share your story and experience the emotions and thoughts that you have about it and process what you need to do next. I, th I think it's a really critical step to preventing you from holding that experience in your body and in your mind. And finally, um, if, if it's uh, depending upon, I mean, you talk to a trusted friend, but, and talk to your therapist if you have a therapist and consider calling the doctor if it's um, either a severe episode um, or if the frequency is getting worse. So I mentioned active recovery. So we're gonna do another mindfulness exercise. It looks like Catherine, we have 25 minutes left. And so we're coming down the home stretch here. Um, this is another five minute meditation that Holly put together for us. Just because I think this is, this is such tough material that I wanted to give you um, a little bit of space to do that active recovery that I was talking about. Welcome to a five minute compassionate body scan. Begin by noticing if you need to make any adjustments to your posture to feel supported. You can settle your hands in your lap and rest your gaze out in front of you or close your eyes if that feels safe. You might set an intention to employ kindness and compassion with yourself during this brief practice, especially when you notice your attention drifting. As if your mind were a small child or a friend walking down a path and naturally became curious about the things along the way. Taking a few slow breaths, see if you can notice the cool air of the inhale and the slightly warmer air of the exhale. And any sensations in your body that accompany your breathing. Move your attention to the bottoms of your feet as if you were moving your attention like a flashlight through the different parts of your body. Explore whatever sensations you may find. As you move up through your lower and upper legs, notice any places you feel clothing or the seat underneath you. If you come across tension or pain, see if you can breathe in and out slowly, inviting the areas to soften. Notice the base of your seat and travel up through your torso and spine, the back body, belly, and chest, expanding and contracting with each cycle of breath. Notice the shoulders and the arms and see if you can let them grow a little heavier. Notice any sensations you feel in the palms of your hands, the tops of your hands or your fingertips. Travel your awareness up through the neck to the muscles in the face, the jaw, the forehead. Seeing if you can release any gripping or holding here. Now take a moment to notice the entire body. You could trace the outline of the shape that you're resting in. Notice any places of comfort or softness. Maybe places you don't feel much sensation at all. 
Observe the tactile and subtle ways the sensations ebb and flow, dulling or intensifying. You might stay with the breath, slowing and savoring the inhales and exhales. You might find some movement like shaking your hands as if you were trying to flick water off, rub your hands together to create some warmth. You might try putting a hand over your heart or giving yourself a hug. And as you do this, I will share a few phrases that I use to facilitate a feeling of compassionate connection. May I be safe and at ease. May I remember that I am not alone. May I be peaceful and present. May I feel gratitude and joy. May I be filled with loving kindness for myself and for others. And when you feel ready, you can gently open your eyes and come back to wherever you are. Thank you for sharing your time and attention with me. I hope you guys are finding these helpful. Welcome to Get It Again, Me and Technology. Okay, we're going to go through irritable um, aggression. Um, irritable aggression is a very frightening possibility. Just the fear or threat of violence is traumatic. Sometimes it's even traumatic to think about it. How is aggression defined? Well, verbal aggression is behavior that is delivered in an intimidating manner, like swearing, yelling, shouting insults, or threats. Damage to pro property is considered aggression, like throwing dishes, hitting the wall, or breaking furniture. Aggression is physical actions that are delivered with the intent to threaten, reject, or harm the target. It can include biting, scratching, pinching, pinching, and slapping. Aggression is considered um, or physical assault um, with intent to injure or maim um, the target is um, also considered aggression. Homicidal impulses and behavior intended to seriously harm or even kill another person. All of those things are considered the spectrum of irritability. And most of the time, that spectrum starts with verbal, like boisterousness, like yow, loud talking, escalates to verbal threats, damage to property, and then you know physical interactions with somebody else. In Huntington's, it may start right immediately with somebody trying to push you away. Um, and other times it might start with extremely loud you know, vocal behavior. Um, I wish I could tell you that there have never been reports of people who are, have Huntington's disease who've killed other people, but I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is that it's rare. And often um, in those situations, there's more than one thing going on. Um, there's a pretty famous case of an, um, an Asheville primary care doctor who killed his fa father that um, his name is um, Vince Gilmer. He's sort of opened up about his story, so I can share that with you. But um, there's some, some information about Vince out there. Um, it, and, and Vince had more than just Huntington's disease. He had unidentified Huntington's disease. He had selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor withdrawal. He had traumatic head injury. He had post-traumatic stress disorder from childhood abuse. So there were an awful lot of things that predisposed that to happen. And what I'm really hoping um, is that um, 
you know, aggressive and early treatment of irritability will prevent these things from happening over the long haul. If, if this frightens you, it's completely understandable. I mean, as a healthcare provider, it, it's my greatest worry as well, that and suicide. My question though, is aggression a complication of untreated irritability? Do these things happen when the people around the person with HD irritability don't recognize the risk? They don't intervene early. They don't think anything can help or they don't have access to knowledgeable healthcare. Remember, irritability can be an early sign of disease, even before any motor symptoms are evident. Many families, most families, just like you have never had to deal with um, neurobiologically driven irritability or a person with Huntington's disease who's having trouble accepting that they have clinical Huntington's and, and they don't wanna hear that and they wanna avoid an actual diagnosis. This, this is really a complicated problem. So this is irritable aggression by the numbers. Um, data about violence in Huntington's disease includes a lot of older studies. Um, they're typically pretty small groups of patients. They're not placebo controlled. Um, patient selection um, uh, might bias their reports to include people who have more severe problems. Um, and in, in all the different studies use different measurement tools. So my guess is that um, I think we can say that aggression in Huntington's is, is a real phenomenon and that it happens um, with some frequency. Um, but my question is, when you look at these numbers, th these are select populations of people. And, you know, do, does this data reflect only untreated people um, or partially treated people. And you know, even though they're in an HD study, they may be followed by a neurologist, they might not be followed by a mental health professional um, and or the family might not talk about it. So it, it's very hard to know how accurate all of these numbers are, but at least we know it's a starting place. Um, if you look at um, what type of behavior um, happens in people with HD. If you look at point prevalence, remember that's that sort of one time and you know one moment in time, about 40% of people report verbal um, aggression. Over the span of that person's lifetime, they or their family report some degree of aggression 75% of the time. The prevalence of physical aggression is lower with a point prevalence of 18 to 20% and a lifetime prevalence of about 50%. When it comes to intensity, like how intense was that aggressive behavior, um, about 25% of those um, episodes are mild, 11% are um, moderate, and um, the overall severe ones as defined by criminal offense is about 4.5%. Um, again, I, I, I want you to be careful about taking these numbers home with you and saying that there is a 75% chance you're walking home to an irritable person, because I don't think that's true. I think what it says is that across the lifetime of somebody who has HD, they're, they're gonna have an irritable moment. It may be way late in their disease. It may be very early in their disease and it never happens again. Um, for example, for your loved one, it may have already come and gone. Um, and if you know there's some other cause of death besides Huntington's disease, fortunately you might not ever see it. So you, um, you have to take, I'm asking you to take this information. Don't look at it uh, with some, um, expectation that you're gonna to have to um, deal with this constantly. Most of the time what happens is that these problems occur and then they reach sort of a crescendo and then there's some sort of intervention and then it falls off. Medications used to treat aggression include um, atypical antipsychotics, which are really first line medications. Um, a lot of times if people are on SSRIs and they have aggression, that will be what will be added to their regimen if they show up with irritable aggression, the atypical antipsychotics will be part of their treatment um, immediately. Um, for other people, mood stabilizers like Depakote might be helpful. 
there's a, a number of third line um, treatments that have been tried, but have very little evidence in Huntington's disease. I mean, there are medication regimens for people who refuse medications. For example, there are injectable long-acting um, antipsychotics and there are antidepressants or SSRIs like fluoxetine that can be given only one time a week. So um, patient refusal is one of the things that you and your doctor can manage. Um, non-pharmacologic interventions. So if you take away nothing else, if somebody has an aggressive episode, it is an indication for a change in your treatment plan. So you need to call the doctor. Now, this is in a low acuity situation where um, no one's at great harm. But if it's enough that you feel like you need urgent intervention, you can call mobile crisis um, you, you would have time to develop a safety plan and practice it, make a list of things that you need if you have to suddenly leave, and have a support person close by. Those, that's the kind of preparation that you can make so that if it happens again, you're in a better position to handle that, that safety plan and um, you know putting stuff together and having a support person person who perhaps could take care of children or maybe an elderly adult. Removing weapons are hard. Um, they're just hard. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to get a chance to talk about that in depth because we're running low on time, but I think it's, a, it's an important thing to consider. In high intervention or high risk situations, leave, run, call 911, um, ask, when you get 911 on the phone, tell them um, that the aggressive person has a neurological disorder and a CIT trained, meaning, um, I can't remember what CIT stands for in the moment, but a CIT, CIT trained officer asks them to respond. Meet the emergency response team, even if you have to leave the house. Um, be prepared to tell the medical team about medications and other medical problems the person might have. If the person with HD is taken to the hospital, they may refuse to allow you to talk to the healthcare provider there. That doesn't mean that you can't call the hospital. Um, if you feel that you won't be safe with the HD person in your home, tell the staff in the ER that you aren't capable of handling their behavior or, or the risk of their behavior. Um, I think that's very important if that's the way you feel to be very firm about that. Um, there's a way to hold somebody for 72 hours, give them medications, and, and help stabilize the situation where you can go home and, and get yourself prepared for them to come back as well. Oh, we do have a moment to talk about weapons. Um, so Americans have a complicated relationship with guns. If you watch the news, you'll see that. Um, I think that this is a different situation from what we, the you know, the mass shootings and um, gun reform. I think this is a different situation. People with HD can be unpredictable and impulsive. And it is, it is, this is my opinion, but I don't think it's safe to have weapons in your home if a person with HD lives there. Um, it just can happen way too quickly. Uh, and you can't always, you think you might have them secured but you never know if you have weapons and a gun in your house, they, they may have swiped a key. You just never know. Um, so the best thing to do is to have them secured outside your home. Talk to your doctor about this. If you have to do it and the patient won't agree to it, during a period of time when they're absent, you can ask law enforcement to come and um, remove all weapons and, and they will do that. There's some... Um, um, links for you on the bottom of this page um, to help you uh, accomplish that if needed. So we're getting ready to stop. I wanted you to have some resources about meditation that might help you. Um, Dan Harris's book, and he's got a podcast. My favorite meditation um, app is Meditation uh, Insight Timer. Um, it's relatively inex inexpensive. inexpensive. Um, Megan Chang does um, a course called The Wisdom of Our Wounds, which is excellent. And Sarah Blondin is um, just a wise soul and always comforting to listen to. 
Um, Holly also has a, a website and it's going to be doing some mindfulness uh, or meditation exercises um, and publish them on her library. So I just want to thank you for attending today. And, and I know I haven't left you a ton of time to talk or ask questions. So um, I'm going to hang around as, as long as you guys have questions, I'm willing to answer them or you can you can email them to Catherine and she'll get them to me. We'll get your, we'll get your questions answered. Um, just my last final thought is just breathe, just take a long, deep breath and know that you're not alone with this. Um, and that there are um, a lot of people that can support you and help you through these experiences, validate your responses to it. You know, they're legitimate. It's okay to be frightened and it's okay to ask for help.